Hello, Booktube. Well, it's a it's a bleak and barren Sunday here at Hyde Cottage. Uh, and for those of you who might be new to the channel, that is the term that I've always used for Sundays uh, because I get no mail. I get no free books in the mail. Uh, this is a an extra bleak Sunday. And uh, Run Right Reads, who's uh, got a Booktube channel, her channel is wonderful. I think you should definitely be subscribed. If you're not, I noticed that she's inching ever closer to 800 subscribers, which is fantastic. That would, that's well-deserved. Uh, she suggested that on this Sunday in particular, I might need a distraction, uh, that I might need a tag, and she made one. She just created one uh, that is the Monopoly book tag. Apparently today is Play Monopoly Day. <laughs> the the, I almost feel like I have to introduce it, but probably not. It's it's a, a board game about finance that is, uh, you know, decades and decades old, and that I imagine is beloved all over the world, uh, except maybe in non-capitalist countries. I I played it often myself, uh, and was also banished from playing it often, uh, because most of my playmates were not human, and every single part, every single moving part of a Monopoly game that you take out of the box is incredibly edible. <laughs> it might not seem that way, but they're all the perfect size to be first played with and then swallowed. Uh, and my playmates tended to do that. So, I, uh, But uh, Run Right Reads has organized a series of prompts around Monopoly. Uh, I guess you have to be sort of familiar with the game, although maybe not. Uh, they're really good prompts, though. Uh, so I thought I would I would go through it uh, and see if I could distract myself, just as she as she advised. Um, so prompt number one is go, which is the linchpin of the whole game. Uh, a, a, a book with go in the title, uh, and the natural the natural answer here, I think, is probably, for, for a bookish crowd, is probably Kawabata's The Master of Go. Uh, but I was thinking of two, uh, two other um, alternatives, the one nonfiction and one fiction. Uh, the nonfiction book is uh, What It Is Like to Go to War by Carl Malantis, who, who uh, did uh, Matterhorn. He did the great big Vietnam War novel Matterhorn. Uh, and when he wrote that book, and, and I, I read it and thought, okay, well, this is, this is a perfect example of a book that exhausts its author. We'll never hear from this writer again. In fact, I probably told a lot of people that. But he wrote a nonfiction work as well. Uh, what it is like to go to war is his nonfiction account of going to the Vietnam War. And uh, it's, it's a gut punch. It, it's a really, really effective book. Uh, not sure. Fiction has such a it's an entree to such a such a wide group of readers that I'm not sure if he had done what it is like to go to war first that he would have become, you know, an overnight celebrity the way he did with his novel. But the what it is like to go to war is an amazing book to read. Uh, and in terms of an, of fiction, instead of Kawabata, I wanted to pick a great novelist who's not known, uh, Bruce Wagner, who did a big novel called I'll Let You Go, uh, about the Trotter family, the extremely wealthy. Trotter family and their their louche inhabitants and their weird eccentric endearing children and all their hangers on and it's an amazing book as well it, Wagner I don't know why he he isn't mentioned in the same breath as all of the the bloated long-winded posers who command the American literary scene I I, uh, I don't know what it is. He publishes with major publishing houses. His, his books are universally praised by critics, and yet <laughs> he's not known. Uh, so that's uh, go figure. But I'll Let You Go is, is a tremendous book to start with. And his. Uh, and prompt number two is Community Chest, uh, a book with a character who, uh, who succeeds because of community. And the first thing that came to mind here was Werner Vinge's great science fiction masterpiece of Fire Upon the Deep. Uh, which is when you think about it, uh, it's, it's set set centuries from now, and it's it's almost impossible to su to summarize. <laughs> uh, but it, it when you think about it, those of you who've read the book will probably agree that when you step back and look at it, it's entirely about community. 
It's entirely, there's no such thing as individuality in the zones of thought, in the, in the, the, the milieu of, of, of the fire upon the deep. Uh, from communal species to, to weaponized communities. It's, it's difficult to summarize, but if you have had a fire upon your deep on your radar or on your TBR, you should definitely read it to count this as a recommendation. Um, uh, question number three, income tax, a book with a character who has a nine to five job. This is one of a few times in this tag where run right reads accidentally triggers, uh, Steve's irritation. <laughs> uh, since I'm sure that because this is book two, most of these questions are aimed at, uh, at fiction. Uh, this is, uh, this, this lands squarely in what has always been for me for the last 50 years. Uh, a deep bone of contention with stupid American contemporary literary fiction. When is the last time that you read in a, a work of contemporary American literary fiction about anyone having a job? Maybe a job as a, as a sort of quirky, idiosyncratic consultant for a, an art uh, exhibit or helping with, a, with a, an eccentric encyclopedia part-time. But a nine-to-five job, you, you have to get ready at eight in the morning, you have to be out the door by 8.15, you, you have to plan your meals and your, your wardrobe the night before, you get back exhausted even though work wasn't physical, and it, it saps your life, and you've, you've got all these ongoing broiling passions and petty grudges that command not just a lot of your time at work, but also a lot of your mental real estate, even when you're not at work, that reality, which is the reality for 99% of the people who are in the world reading, is never reflected in fiction. Never. <laughs> it's and, and I don't know that a lot of readers of contemporary fiction realize how condescending that is. Uh, that, that there can't be, that if, if I'm going to write a story with any kind of resonance or drama, it's going to have to take place somewhere else, not in that world. Uh, the, the, when I was thinking about this question, a, ca a book with a character has a nine to five job, I could scarcely think of one outside of police procedurals. And in police procedurals, even there, the main characters who have nine to five jobs would lose them instantly if they acted the way they do in the real world. <laughs> I don't have an answer to the question. Maybe you will. Uh, I think it's a it, it inadvertently points at an incredible flaw of contemporary fiction, contemporary literary fiction. Uh, that noise you hear is a, a puppy. Uh, she's furiously destroying something. <laughs> she's always furiously destroying something. Uh, um, question number four, uh, Railroad, a book with a significant scene on a train. Uh, and the... the classic one that came to mind is uh, Agatha Christie's 1957 novel, What Mrs. McGillicuddy Saw, which has the just a, a perfect setup for a murder mystery, as so many of her novels do, where a friend, a, a woman, is, is taking the train. She looks out the window of her train in motion at a passing train going in the other direction and glimpses through her window and its window a man with his back to her strangling a woman. And it, by sheer coincidence, which is going to come up later in this tag, she's a friend of Miss Marple, one of Agatha Christie's in, intrepid sleuths, who believes her when no one else does, and, and works out how you would figure out what that train was, who was in that car, who isn't accounted for, and maybe where along that route a body could be dumped. It's amazing. It's it's no surprise to me that it's been adapted so many times because it's it's a it's a, a rock solid premise for a book, <laughs> uh, and it it naturally came to mind. But there's another book uh, that comes to mind. It's, it's it's a little bit more of a long shot. It's it from, from uh, twenty years after. It's Morton Friedman's book. The Taking of Pelham 123, uh, which is a, a thriller about a group of criminals who commandeer a New York subway train. And it too has been made adapted for the screen twice. And uh, 
it's a it's a very effective story. I, Friedman was a um, an incredible hack uh, who didn't have a, a, a speck of literary ability, but even so, uh, it's it's a very effective book. Uh, um, so I recommend both of those. There are all sorts of others that came to mind, uh, but those two those two will will do for a start. Um, um, prompt number five is Chance, a book about luck. And this is another instance where this tag points to uh, systematic flaws in contemporary fiction. Uh, the main one here being that it, almost all of it is almost entirely dependent on luck. And that's not, that's lazy storytelling. If you don't build a story, if instead you make it something that happens, so uh, it just so happens that you are present at an explosion, or it just so happens uh, that that you know you're one foot next, you're one, you're right next to someone who's hit by a falling piano, something like that. If you think about almost all the works of contemporary, think about the last ten works of contemporary fiction that you have read. And ask yourself, if you removed random chance from this plot, how much of the plot would remain? It's virtually nothing. In almost every time, in almost every instance, even when I like the novel, in almost every instance I am waiting for some incident of just deus ex machina, blind luck, good or bad, to get the story started <laughs> and to keep it going more and more writers don't even seem aware <clears throat> that they're relying on such a thing, much less that it's bankrupt to rely on it. You think about stories that don't involve random chance, and <clears throat> it's annoying. <laughs> so uh, uh, so I have, uh, when it comes to the prompt, a book about luck, virtually any novel that I've read in 2017 is entirely dependent on luck, if by luck we mean the, the striking of random chance, good or bad. Virtually every novel that I've read this year has been entirely dependent on luck. Uh, so, <laughs> and the, the handful of ones that haven't, that where the writer, bless their, their little cafe-haunting, coke-snorting souls, has tried to construct an actual plot, they've made a horrible pig's black breakfast of it. It's, they've proven that they can't do it. The, that this is one among many of the fundamental, absolutely basic techniques of their craft that they haven't mastered and have never been required to master. <laughs> it's, uh, anyway, <laughs> let's, let's move on to uh, the next one. The next prompt is Jail, uh, a book with a character who goes to jail. And, uh, of course, there, there are endless candidates here. Uh, but I wanted to think of one for, for nonfiction, and the one I thought about for nonfiction is actually connected to fiction. Uh, because it's it's the the three volume work that Jeffrey Archer wrote, the, the best selling novelist Jeffrey Archer went to jail, uh, and wrote a three volume work, his prison diary, that is inadvertently hilarious. It, it, this is this is a man who uh, who has never admitted doing anything wrong, who has unbelievably high opinion of himself. If, if he was walking through his living room in the middle of the night and stubbed his toe on the sofa, he would angrily demand an apology from the sofa. And the, his ordinarily, a prison diary, that's a, it's a subcategory of nonfiction on its own, and ordinarily it is a literature of inner revelation. Ordinarily, hearing those metal doors clang shut behind you and realizing you no longer control your life, not when you eat, not when you sleep, and not your personal liberty. Ordinarily, that moment prompts a book of uh, soul-searching. And it's amazing how thoroughly Jeffrey Archer avoids that in, in Prison Diary. It's, in, in, it's amazing. It's, it's uh, a work I would actually recommend before I recommend any of his fiction. <laughs> so, uh, it's hard to describe what I'm talking about, but no one has ever written a Prison Diary like his. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see here. Prompt number seven is uh, Electric Company, a uh, book with a character who has what they think are great ideas but are really harebrained schemes. I was thinking about this and I was realizing how many books I love 
uh, fit that description uh, for, from uh, the Jeeves and Worcester stories of P.G. Woodhouse to another Woodhouse, Emma Woodhouse, from Jane Austen's Emma, who, uh, who has lots of harebrained schemes that, that don't turn out to be any good. Uh, it's a, it used to be a, a backbone of fiction that you would that one of the ways that the writer would create and sustain internal tension in the story was for you, the reader, to know better than the characters, to know something better than the characters, uh, and that that's a, a tried and true way to go to go about that is to have one of the characters involved in a scheme where you can see how it's going to fall apart and they can't. Someone knows I'm talking on camera. <laughs> now you settle down while I finish with this. All right? Somebody will do a puppy tag one of these days. Uh, let's see here. Where were we? Um... Okay, prompt number eight is free parking, a book that features a traffic incident. Uh, again, lots of candidates, but the one that comes to mind is fresh on my mind. It's The Seventh Function of Language by Laurent Binet. It's a uh, novel, um, a contemporary novel that is, you read the description of it on Goodreads or Amazon, and you would, from the description, you would think there is no possible way that a book about French intellectualism <laughs> can be entertaining much less funny. There is no possible way that I would like this novel. And uh, it starts with a traffic accident. It starts with a, a famous semiotician being struck by a truck in, in the street. Uh, and the, the plot germinates from the suspicion that maybe it was intentional, that maybe the, it was murder, uh, even though the driver seems completely innocent. Uh, and you, you read that, and then you read the rest of the plot description and you think oh no <laughs> this is a this is way outside my comfort zone uh but i i would urge you to ignore that i thought the same thing and it's a it's a, a wonderful engaging funny book uh that i i loved so and it starts with a traffic accident so it counts um uh let's see here prompt number nine is waterworks a book with a character who cries a lot uh, I don't have a specific book in mind, but I definitely have, a, definitely have a specific character in mind. That character is Winston Churchill, who, in every biography, it cries at the drop of a hat. And uh, your first impulse when you're reading a long biography of him, particularly, is to feel a little pity about that because it's obviously it, it's a it's a well-known byproduct of of severe alcoholism. Is is you know hyper sentimentality, hyper emotionalism, lack of control over emotions, alcoholics tend to cry. And Churchill was a, a hardened alcoholic from his late twenties. So by the time he was commanding the fates of thousands, he would cry uh, for tears of joy or sorrow almost every day. Uh, at first you feel pity, but when the person who is, who is authorizing slaughters, and and provoking situations in which thousands of young men will march to their deaths is also having a good sodden sentimental cry at the end of the day you don't quite feel so much pity you feel a lot of other emotions but not pity uh, so i'm gonna i'm gonna just use churchill there instead of uh instead of a particular book uh, prompt number 10 is hotel a book set in a hotel uh and as i mentioned uh Agatha Christie, you might think that I'm, I'm immediately going to mention At Bertram's Hotel, one, one of her uh, her other novels. Uh, but but even though that has hotel right in the title, it's not the first Agatha Christie thing that came to mind. First thing that came to mind is what I consider to be the best Agatha Christie novel of them all, The Body in the Library, uh, a large part of which takes place at Danemouth, at the Majestic Hotel in Danemouth, and revolves around the hotel tennis instructor, uh, and, a, and a, a feckless, stupid teenager named Ruby Keen. Uh, so that, that I'm, I'm going to use that as an answer and also as a recommendation. I highly recommend The Body in the Library. Uh, prompt number 11 is Rent, a book with a character who has trouble paying the rent. And once again, <laughs> once again, this tag underscores the absolute undressed poverty of contemporary fiction. 
because I mean, nonfiction, yes, absolutely. In, in, in half the biographies that I read in 2017, the star of the show before they become famous has trouble paying rent. The first third of every great biography is a story of someone having trouble paying the rent, but in fiction, in contemporary fiction, what are people's expenses? When does anybody ever bounce a check, come short in a, in a crucial payment, want something that they can't have, and not have a madcap, zany, multi-person scheme to get it, just simply not have it, want it but not have it? When is the last time you read a novel about someone who had trouble paying the rent? I'm asking seriously, because I read a lot of contemporary fiction, and all of it seems to me to take place in a fantasy land no less outlandish than the one in Fire Upon the Deep. People who have nothing to do all day. Everybody who has nothing to do all day, except for the rude mechanicals who are constantly slathered with condescension and patronization by the characters and the author in the course of the book. So, of course, you know, the, the main character and, and his his love interest and her ex-love interest and the zany plan that they're unfolding, of course they will have the occasional meal in a restaurant, which will give the writer a perfect opportunity to haul in a one-dimensional character with a name tag and an apron. But when do the characters themselves ever need to earn money, ever need to pay money, ever not be able to do that in a way that is simply humdrum or that preys on their nerves at night, but, but that isn't dramatic? I mean, you might say it's a novelist's job to provide us with dramatics, but most novelists wouldn't say that, and most of their critics don't say that. Most of their critics spout some line right away about a reflection of the, you know, a mirror of, of present society, of the way we live now, is the famous phrase. Uh, so I don't have an answer to this. A book, especially a modern contemporary novel, where a character has trouble paying the rent, I can't think of one. Uh, can't think of when, of when rent comes up. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's the last rant, I promise. <laughs> uh, the last prompt is bankrupt. Uh, and it's a book in, with, a, with a character who is bankrupt in some way, financially, morally, uh, emotionally. Uh, and I'm glad I mentioned The Way We Live Now, because that's the, that's the answer that I want to give, is Trollope, Anthony Trollope's great novel, The Way We Live Now, which has at its center a swindling businessman named Melmoth, whose bankruptcy uh, becomes the, the great climax of the book. But right from page one and going all throughout the book, you realize that the whole novel is full of people who are bankrupt in one of those ways, financially, morally, emotionally. The, there's virtually nobody who isn't in, in the course of this thousand-page book. Uh, and that you know, that, that bankruptcy might very well be the theme of the book. Uh, and I wanted to mention it, not only to finish with that, but also to, to say that I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually wondering if anybody wants to do a read-along of the way we live now. I, I jokingly proposed it earlier in the month, uh, but I would love to do it if there's anybody who wants to. I've never done a read-along before, uh, except not with people. I, I did a, a, a sort of chapter by chapter rundown of the Lord of the Rings, but I've never done a read along that was involved, that was, you know, uh, that had multiple parts, <laughs> more, more than one speaker. Uh, so uh, let me know if you want to do that. The way, the way we live now, though, is definitely the answer to this question of bankrupt. Uh, and that uh, that is it. That is the, the Monopoly book tag, uh, which was created by Run right reads, and I'm very grateful uh, to be tagged because I, I I really needed it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up for now and see what uh, treasured possessions of mine have just recently been destroyed. <laughs> uh, but I'll be back. Uh, thank you, Booktube.